Part Seven of Volume Three of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume Three of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans, translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Fabius Maximus, Part Three. In view of such a complete success, Hannibal's friends urged him to follow up his good fortune and dash into their city on the heels of the flying enemy, assuring him in that case that on the fifth day after his victory he would sup on the capital. It is not easy to say what consideration turned him from this course. Nay, it would rather seem that his evil genius or some divinity interposed to inspire him with the hesitation and timidity which he now showed. Wherefore, as they say, Barca, the Carthaginian, said to him angrily, Thou canst win a victory, but thy victory thou canst not use. And yet his victory wrought a great change in his circumstances. Before the battle he had not a city, not a trading place, not a seaport in Italy, and could with difficulty barely supply his army with provisions by foraging, since he had no secure base of supplies for the war, but wandered hither and thither with his army as if it were a great horde of robbers. After the battle, however, he brought almost all Italy under his sway. Most of its peoples, and the largest of them too, came over to him of their own accord, and Capua, which is the most considerable city after Rome, attached herself firmly to his cause. Not only, then, does it work great mischief, as Euripides says, to put friends to the test, but also prudent generals. For that which was called cowardice and sluggishness in Fabius before the battle, immediately after the battle was thought to be no mere human calculation, nay, rather, a divine and marvellous intelligence, since it looked so far into the future and foretold a disaster which could hardly be believed by those who experienced it. In him, therefore, Rome at once placed her last hopes. To his wisdom she fled for refuge as to temple and altar, believing that it was first and chiefly due to his prudence that she still remained a city, and was not utterly broken up, as in the troublous times of the Gallic invasion. For he who, in times of apparent security, appeared cautious and irresolute, then, when all were plunged in boundless grief and helpless confusion, was the only man to walk the city with calm step, composed countenance, and gracious address, checking effeminate lamentation, and preventing those from assembling together who were eager to make public their common complaints. He persuaded the Senate to convene, heartened up the magistrates, and was himself the strength and power of every magistracy, since all looked to him for guidance. Accordingly, he put guards at the gates, in order to keep the frightened throng from abandoning the city, and set limits of time and place to the mourning for the dead, ordering any who wished to indulge in lamentation to do so at home for a period of thirty days. After that, all mourning must cease and the city be purified of such rites. And since the festival of Ceres fell within these days, it was deemed better to remit entirely the sacrifices and the procession, rather than to emphasize the magnitude of their calamity by the small number and the dejection of the participants. For the gods' delight is in honors paid them by the fortunate. However, all the rites which the augurs advocated for the propitiation of the gods, or to avert inauspicious omens, were duly performed. And besides, Pictor, a kinsman of Fabius, was sent to consult the oracle at Delphi. And when two of the vestal virgins were found to have been corrupted, one of them was buried alive, according to the custom, and the other slew herself. But most of all was the gentle dignity of the city to be admired in this, that when Varro, the consul, came back from his flight, as one would come back from a most ill-starred and disgraceful experience, in humility and dejection, the Senate and the whole people met him at the gates with a welcome. The magistrates and the chief men of the city, of whom Fabius was one, praised him, as soon as quiet was restored, because he had not despaired of the city after so great a misfortune, but was at hand to assume the reins of government, and to employ the laws and his fellow-citizens in accomplishing the salvation which lay within their power. When they learned that Hannibal, after the battle, had turned aside into the other parts of Italy, they plucked up courage and sent out commanders with armies. The most illustrious of these were Fabius Maximus and Claudius Marcellus, men who were similarly admired for directly opposite characters. The latter, as has been stated in his life, was a man of splendid and impetuous actions, with an arm of ready vigor, and by nature like the men whom Homer is wont to call fond of battle, and eager for the fray. He therefore conducted his first engagements in the venturesome and reckless style of warfare, which met the daring of such a man as Hannibal with an equal daring. 
Fabius, on the contrary, clung to his first and famous convictions, and looked to see Hannibal, if only no one fought with him or harassed him, become his own worst enemy, wear himself out in the war, and speedily lose his high efficiency, like an athlete whose bodily powers have been overtaxed and exhausted. It was for these reasons that, Posidonius says, the Romans called Fabius their buckler, and Marcellus their sword, and that the mingling of the firm steadfastness of the one, with the versatility of the other, proved the salvation of Rome. By his frequent encounters with Marcellus, whose course was like that of a swiftly flowing river, Hannibal saw his forces shaken and swept away, while by Fabius, whose course was slow, noiseless, and unceasing in its stealthy hostility, they were imperceptibly worn away and consumed. And finally he was brought to such a pass that he was worn out with fighting Marcellus, and afraid of Fabius when not fighting. For it was with these two men that he fought almost all the time, as they held the offices of praetor, proconsul, or council, and each of them was council five times. However, when Marcellus was serving as consul for the fifth time, Hannibal led him into an ambush and slew him. But he had no success against Fabius, although he frequently brought all sorts of deceitful tests to bear upon him. Once, it is true, he did deceive the man, and came near giving him a disastrous overthrow. He composed and sent to Fabius letters purporting to come from the chief men of Metapontum, assuring him that their city would be surrendered to him if he should come there and that those who were contriving the surrender only waited for him to come and show himself in the neighborhood. These letters moved Fabius to action, and he proposed to take a part of his force and set out by night. Then he got unfavorable auspices, and was turned from his purpose by them, and in a little while it was discovered that the letters which had come to him were cunning forgeries by Hannibal, who had laid an ambush for him near the city. This escape, however, may be laid to the favor of the gods. Fabius thought that the revolts of the cities and the agitations of the allies ought to be restrained and discountenanced, rather by mild and gentle measures, without testing every suspicion and showing harshness in every case to the suspected. It is said, for instance, that when he learned about a Marcian soldier, eminent among the allies for valor and high birth, who had been talking with some of the soldiers in the camp about deserting to the enemy, he was not incensed with him, but admitted frankly that he had been unduly neglected. So far, he said, this was the fault of the commanders, who distributed their honors by favor rather than for valor. But in the future it would be the man's own fault if he did not come to him and tell him when he wanted anything. These words were followed by the gift of a war-horse and by other signal rewards for bravery, and from that time on there was no more faithful and zealous man in the service. Fabius thought it hard that, whereas the trainers of horses and dogs relied upon care and intimacy and feeding rather than on golds and heavy collars for the removal of the animal's obstinacy, anger, and discontent, the commander of men should not base the most of his discipline on kindness and gentleness, but show more harshness and violence in his treatment of them than farmers in their treatment of wild fig-trees, wild pear-trees, and wild olive-trees, which they reclaim and domesticate till they bear luscious olives, pears, and figs. Accordingly, when another soldier, a Lucanian, was reported by his officers as frequently quitting his post and roaming away from the camp, Fabius asked them what kind of a man they knew him to be in other respects. All testified that such another soldier could not easily be found, and rehearsed sundry exploits of his wherein he had shown conspicuous bravery. Fabius therefore inquired into the cause of the man's irregularity, and discovered that he was deeply in love with the maid, and risked his life in long journeys from the camp every time he visited her. Accordingly, without the man's knowledge, Fabius sent and arrested the girl, and hid her in his own tent. Then he called the Lucanian to him privately, and said, It is well known that, contrary to Roman custom and law, you often pass the night away from camp, but it is also well known that you have done good service in the past. Your transgressions shall therefore be atoned for by your deeds of valor, but for the future I shall put another person in charge over you. Then, to the soldier's amazement, he led the girl forth and put her in his hand, saying, This person pledges herself that you will hereafter remain in camp with us, and you will now show plainly whether or not you left us for some other and base purpose, making this maid and your love for her a mere pretext. Such is the story which is told about this matter. The city of Tarentum, which had been lost to the Romans by treachery, Fabius recovered in the following manner. There was a young man of Tarentum in his army, and he had a sister who was very faithfully and affectionately disposed towards him. With this woman, the commander of the forces set by Hannibal to guard the city, a Brutian, was deeply enamoured, 
and the circumstance led her brother to hope that he could accomplish something by means of it. He therefore joined his sister in Tarentum, ostensibly as a deserter from the Romans, though he was really sent into the city by Fabius, who was privy to his scheme. Some days passed, accordingly, during which the Brutian remained at home, since the woman thought that her amour was unknown to her brother. Then her brother had the following words with her. I would have you know that a story was very current out there in the Roman camp that you have interviews with a man high in authority. Who is this man? For if he is, as they say, a man of repute, and illustrious for his valour, war, that confounder of all things, makes very little account of race. Nothing is disgraceful if it is done under compulsion. Nay, we may count it rare good fortune, at a time when right is weak, to find might very gentle with us. Thereupon the woman sent for her Brutian, and made her brother acquainted with him. The barbarian's confidence was soon gained, since the brother fostered his passion and plainly induced the sister to be more complacent and submissive to him than before, so that it was not difficult, the man being a lover and a mercenary as well, to change his allegiance, in anticipation of the large gifts which it was promised that he should receive from Fabius. This is the way the story is usually told. But some writers say that the woman by whom the Brutian was won over was not a Tarentine, but a Brutian, and a concubine of Fabius, and that when she learned that the commander of the Brutian garrison was a fellow countryman and an acquaintance of hers, she told Fabius, held a conference with a man beneath the walls of the city, and won him completely over. While this plot was under way, Fabius schemed to draw Hannibal away from the neighborhood, and therefore gave orders to the garrison at Regium to overrun Brutium and take Colonia by storm. This garrison numbered eight thousand, most of them deserters, and the refuse of the soldiers sent home from Sicily in disgrace by Marcellus, men whose loss would least afflict and injure Rome. Fabius expected that by casting these forces, like a bait, in front of Hannibal, he would draw him away from Tarentum. And this was what actually happened. For Hannibal immediately swept thither in pursuit with his army. But five days after Fabius had laid siege to Tarentum, the youth who, with his sister, had come to an understanding with the Brutian commander in the city, came to him by night. He had seen and knew precisely the spot at which the Brutian was watching with the purpose of handing the city over to its assailants. Fabius, however, would not suffer his enterprise to depend wholly upon the betrayal of the city. While, therefore, he himself led a detachment quietly to the appointed spot, the rest of his army attacked the walls by land and sea, with great shouting and tumult, until most of the Tarentines had run to the aid of those who were defending them. Then the Brutian gave Fabius the signal, and he scaled the walls and got the mastery of the city. At this point, however, Fabius seems to have been overcome by his ambition, for he ordered his men to put the Brutians first of all to the sword, that his possession of the city might not be known to be due to treachery. He not only failed to prevent this knowledge, but incurred also the reproach of perfidy and cruelty. Many of the Tarentines also were slain, thirty thousand of them were sold into slavery, their city was plundered by the Roman army, and three thousand talents were thereby brought into the public treasury. While everything else was carried off as plunder, it is said that the accountant asked Fabius what his orders were concerning the gods, for so he called their pictures and statues, and that Fabius answered, Let us leave their angered gods for the Tarentines. However, he removed the colossal statue of Heracles from Tarentum, and set it up on the capital, and near it an equestrian statue of himself in bronze. He thus appeared far more eccentric in these matters than Marcellus. Nay, rather, the mild and humane conduct of Marcellus was thus made to seem altogether admirable by contrast, as it has been written in his life. It is said that Hannibal had got within five miles of Tarentum when it fell, and that openly he remarked, It appears, then, that the Romans have another Hannibal, for we have lost Tarentum even as we took it but that in private he was then for the first time led to confess to his friends that he had long seen the difficulty, and now saw the impossibility of their mastering Italy with their present forces. For this success Fabius celebrated a second triumph more splendid than his first, since he was contending with Hannibal like a clever athlete, and easily baffling all his undertakings, now that his hugs and grips no longer had their old-time vigor. For his forces were partly enervated by luxury and wealth, and partly blunted, as it were, and worn out by their unremitting struggles. Now there was a certain Marcus Livius, who commanded the garrison of Tarentum when Hannibal got the city to revolt. 
He occupied the citadel, however, and was not dislodged from this position, but held it until the Romans again got the upper hand of the Tarentines. This man was vexed by the honors paid to Fabius, and once, carried away by his jealousy and ambition, said to the Senate that it was not Fabius but himself who should be credited with the capture of Tarentum. At this Fabius laughed, and said, "'You are right. Had you not lost the city, I had not taken it.' Among the other marks of high favor which the Romans conferred upon Fabius, they made his son Fabius counsel. When this son had entered upon his office and was arranging some matter pertaining to the war, his father, either by reason of his age and weakness, or because he was putting his son to the test, mounted his horse and rode towards him through the throng of bystanders. The young man caught sight of his father at a distance and would not suffer what he did, but sent a lictor with orders for him to dismount and come to the council on foot, if he had any need of his offices. All the rest were offended at this command, and implied by their silent gaze at Fabius that this treatment of him was unworthy of his high position. But Fabius himself sprang quickly from his horse, almost ran to his son, and embraced him affectionately. "'My son,' he said, "'you are right in thought and act. You understand what a people has made you its officer, and what a high office you have received from them. It was in this spirit that our fathers and we ourselves have exalted Rome, a spirit which makes parents and children ever secondary to our country's good. And of a truth it is reported of the great-grandfather of our Fabius, that though he had the greatest reputation and influence in Rome, and though he had himself been consul five times, and had celebrated the most splendid triumphs for the greatest wars, he nevertheless, when his son was consul, went forth to war with him as his lieutenant, and in the triumph that followed, while the son entered the city on a four-horse chariot, the father followed on horseback with the rest of the train, exulting in the fact that, though he was master of his son and was the greatest of the citizens both in name and in fact, he yet put himself beneath the law and its official. However, this was not the only admirable thing about him. But the son of our Fabius, as it happened, died, and this affliction he bore with equanimity, like a wise man and a good father. The funeral oration, which is pronounced at the obsequies of illustrious men by some kinsmen, he delivered himself from his place in the forum, and then wrote out the speech and published it. But now Cornelius Scipio was sent into Spain, where he not only conquered the Carthaginians in many battles, and drove them out of the country, but also won over a multitude of nations, and took great cities with splendid spoils, so that on his return to Rome he enjoyed an incomparable favor and fame, and was made consul. Perceiving that the people demanded and expected a great achievement from him, he regarded the hand-to-hand -hand struggle with Hannibal there in Italy as very antiquated and senile policy, and purposed to fill Libya at once, and the territory of Carthage itself, with Roman arms and soldiery, and ravage them, and thus to transfer the war from Italy thither. To this policy he urged the people with all his soul. But just at this point Fabius tried to fill the city with all sorts of fear. They were hurrying, he said, under the guidance of a foolhardy young man, into the remotest and greatest peril, and he spared neither word nor deed which he thought might defer the citizens from this course. He brought the Senate over to his views, but the people thought that he attacked Scipio through jealousy of his success, and that he was afraid lest, if Scipio performed some great and glorious exploit, and either put an end to the war entirely, or removed it out of Italy, his own failure to end the war after all these years would be attributed to sloth and cowardice. Now it is likely that Fabius began this opposition out of his great caution and prudence, in fear of the danger, which was great, but that he grew more violent and went to greater lengths in his opposition out of ambition and rivalry, in an attempt to check the rising influence of Scipio. For he even tried to persuade Crassus, Scipio's colleague in the consulship, not to surrender the command of the army, and not to yield to Scipio, but to proceed in person against Carthage, if that policy were adopted. He also prevented the granting of monies for the war. As for monies, since he was obliged to provide them for himself, Scipio collected them on his private account from the cities of Etruria, which were devotedly attached to him. And as for Crassus, it was partly his nature, which was not contentious, but gentle, that kept him at home, and partly also a religious custom, for he was Pontifex Maximus, or high priest. Accordingly, Fabius took another way to oppose Scipio, and tried to hinder and restrain the young men who were eager to serve under him, crying out in sessions of the Senate and the Assembly 
that it was not Scipio himself only who was running away from Hannibal, but that he was sailing off from Italy with her reserve forces, playing upon the hopes of her young men, and persuading them to abandon their parents, their wives, and their city, although the enemy still sat at her gates, masterful and undefeated. And verily he frightened the Romans with these speeches, and they decreed that Scipio should employ only the forces which were then in Sicily, and take with him only three hundred of the men who had been with him in Spain, men who had served him faithfully. In this course, at any rate, Fabius seems to have been influenced by his own cautious temper. But as soon as Scipio had crossed into Africa, tidings were brought to home of wonderful achievements and of exploits transcendent in magnitude and splendor. These reports were confirmed by abundant spoils which followed them. The king of Numidia was taken captive. Two of the enemy's camps were at once destroyed by fire, and in them a great number of men, arms, and horses. Embassies were sent from Carthage to Hannibal urgently calling upon him to give up his fruitless hopes in Italy, and come to the aid of his native city. And when every tongue in Rome was dwelling on the theme of Scipio's successes, then Fabius demanded that a successor should be sent out to replace him. He gave no other reason, but urged the well-remembered maxim that it was dangerous to entrust such vast interest to the fortune of a single man, since it was difficult for the same man to have good fortune always. By this course he gave offence now to many, who thought him a captious and malicious man, or one whose old age had robbed him utterly of courage and confidence, so that he was immoderately in awe of Hannibal. For not even after Hannibal and his army had sailed away from Italy, would he suffer the rejoicing and fresh courage of the citizens to be undisturbed and assured. But then even more than ever he insisted that the city was running into extremest peril, and that her affairs were in a dangerous plight. For Hannibal, he said, would fall upon them with all the greater effect in Africa at the gates of Carthage, and Scipio would be confronted with an army yet warm with the blood of many imperators, dictators, and consuls. Consequently, the city was once more confounded by these speeches, and although the war had been removed to Africa, they thought its terrors were nearer Rome. But shortly afterwards Scipio utterly defeated Hannibal himself in battle, humbled and trod underfoot the pride of fallen Carthage, restored to his fellow-citizens a joy that surpassed all their hopes, and in very truth righted once more the ship of their supremacy, which had been shaken in a heavy surge. Fabius Maximus, however, did not live to see the end of the war, nor did he even hear of Hannibal's defeat, nor behold the great and assured prosperity of the country. But about the time when Hannibal set sail from Italy, he fell sick and died. Epaminondas, it is true, was buried by the Thebans at the public cost, because of the poverty in which he died, for it is said that nothing was found in his house after his death except a piece of iron money. Fabius, however, was not buried by the Romans at the public charge, but each private citizen contributed the smallest coin in his possession, not because his poverty called for their aid, but because the people felt that it was burying a father, whose death thus received honor and regard befitting his life. End of Fabius Maximus